So um, I'm Linda Cardozo. I'm urogynecologist at King's College Hospital in London, and I'm chairing this session. And this session is all about mesh and how we're using it in different parts of the world. So we have four expert speakers for you this afternoon. We're going to start with my colleague Dudley Robinson, who's a urogynecologist from King's College Hospital in London. Then we're going to go on, and he's going to give you the UK perspective. We're then going to go on to Reno de Tarek, uh, who's going to give you the European perspective, although he assures me it'll mainly be the French perspective, and he's, he's a gynecologist. And then we're going to go on to Roger Domkowski, who is in Nashville, Tennessee, at Vanderbilt University. And he's a urologist and is going to give you the US perspective. And then Richard Inman, who's from Sheffield, UK, and a urologist, is going to talk to you about what basic science has to offer in this field. And then hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes for a very active discussion. Um, and I hope you are all going to participate. So without further ado, Dudley, can you come and talk to us? Thank you very much, uh, Linda, and uh, thank you to the ICS for the kind invitation to speak this afternoon. And as Linda said, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview um, of MESH from the UK perspective. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a consultant urogynecologist, and this is where I work at King's College Hospital in South East London. And these are my uh, relevant disclosures. So within the UK, the, the mesh controversy, if you like, initially started uh, in Scotland in October 2013, when a group of patients who'd had mesh complications got together. And uh, it was on the back of this that the Scottish Health Minister called for an urgent review and investigation. And this was the start of the whole mesh process. Now, the, um, it was also interesting to note that he was coming up for re-election at that time as well. So there may just have been a slight political component to this as well. So on the back of that uh, investigation which was started, the Scottish MESH report was um, reported in March 2017, and it gave a, re a review of tapes for incontinence and also vaginal MESH for prolapse. And if we look at the um, incontinence data, it's quite interesting because what they do here is they compare the different continence procedures to a colpo suspension. So at the top of this slide, you'll see colpo suspension, and the bottom two bars are the synthetic mediurethral tapes. And what you'll immediate, immediately notice is that you tend to get fewer complications with a mediurethral tape than you do with a colpo suspension. <laughs> Bulking agents tend to have more complications, but of course that's related to failure. They then went on and looked at it in a slightly different way. So this time they used um, colpo suspension as the baseline, and then compared the um, other operations, red means more risk, green means less risk. So again, if you move down to the bottom of the slide, you can see there's less risk associated with mid-urethral tapes as compared to the burnt colpo suspension. They gave other um, advice, so we should be managing our patients using a multidisciplinary approach, we should audit our results. They stressed the importance of informed consent, which is something that I'll come back to. They said there was uh, a lack of evidence on long terms of, of effects of vaginal mesh and mesh for continence, and we needed to be more aware of the mesh complications. Women should be offered all treatment uh, options for treating stress urinary incontinence, and if you were to use a tape, then they recommended the retropubic approach. Uh, Transvaginal mesh should not be offered, and there was no evidence to suggest better outcomes uh, using vaginal mesh for prolapse. So the second report from the UK was the English report. So this is from the MESH Oversight Group. And it says very similar things. So surgeons must have appropriate training, which I'm sure we'd all agree with. We must audit our results. We need to report our um, uh, complications to regulatory bodies. Again, stressing the importance of information giving, of shared decision making and informed consent, to follow the NICE guidelines. And I'm going to show you the most recent NICE guidelines to improve GP awareness of mesh complications, and also they identified mesh complication centers to deal with those mesh problems. In this report, they raised awareness regarding the symptoms which may be associated with mesh complications and the signs. And over on the right-hand side, you can see here a number of units within the UK that were listed as mesh removal centers. And when you look at that, these were all self-nominated, so there wasn't any sort of peer review process uh, done at this time. There was also a good deal of controversy regarding the licensing and registration of mesh products, and this is perhaps most graphically not uh, illustrated by this uh, article in the Times. So Carl Hennigan is a professor of evidence-based medicine um, from Oxford, 
and he put in a spoof application for a mesh product uh, which was almost um, accepted for, uh, for usage and then he revealed that it was the orange bag that we carry our oranges home uh, from, from the supermarket. So questions were raised regarding licensing and registration. Within the UK there's been a huge media interest. This is a, a, a slide shot of uh, something from Sky News uh, suggesting this may be worse than thalidomide. And of course there was also questions asked uh, within Parliament. So at the front of this slide you see Owen Smith who's an MP from North Wales and around him are the MESH supporters groups uh, with one uh, urogynecologist at the back on the left. Within the UK, we've also seen uh, the rise of the mesh pressure groups, of which the most vocal and the most active are Sling the Mesh, uh, but there's also other ones such as TV teams as well. And they tend to have a huge presence on Twitter. If any of you use Twitter, and if you look, uh, there's always a good deal of uh, tweets from both of these groups. It all really started coming to a head in December 2017, again with the media. There was uh, documentary programs um, on television. You can see Linda. Uh, took part in the BBC Panorama programme, and it was at this time, really, that people started talking about the possibility of a mesh ban. In February 2018, the Royal Colleges within the UK um, suggested that it, was, it should be compulsory to audit our results, which is now something that is ongoing. And also, Jeremy Hunt, who was the then Health Secretary, uh, suggested that there should be an inquiry into the mesh scandal, and this is currently still being led uh, by Baroness Cumberledge, uh, it was originally meant to be reported in March of this year, but it's now been put, been put back and will hopefully uh, report by the end of the year, which has led to further complications that I'll explain at the end. So uh, the information was to, to gather mesh data. So this is the uh, NHS digital mesh audit, which was performed within the UK. And you can see this was carried out between 2008 and 2017. And during that time, around 2,000 women um, had an, uh, oh, sorry, 1,000 women had a non-mesh procedure for stress incontinence, and around 100 times that number had a, mid a synthetic mid-urethral tape. You'll also note that there's been a 48% reduction in the, uh, the number of uh, continence procedures being performed over that time. But if you look at the bottom, you can see removal rates before 30 days and after 30 days tended to be low and to be uh, approximately 7 in 1,000. So we thought that was fairly good reassuring data from that national audit. So it was somewhat surprising in July 2018 when there was an immediate pause uh, or suspension of all mesh procedures within the UK. So that's vaginal mesh for prolapse and also mid urethral tapes for incontinence. And subsequently since then questions are also being asked regarding hernia mesh and the complications associated with that. Although at the moment uh, that yet hasn't yet been banned. So where are we now? So these are the new NICE guidelines which were published in April 2019 and you can see if a conservative management option has failed then uh, we are now allowed to offer an open or laparoscopic colposuspension, suspension, an autologous rectal fascia sling or a retropubic mid uh, tape. However, we're not allowed to offer a transobturator approach only in special circumstances, a top-down approach such as the SPARC in clinical trials only and also single incision mini slings uh, which have been uh, reserved for clinical trials. And um, also, of course, the importance of uh, being able to offer something different, so intramural bulking agents if other surgical alternatives uh, aren't possible. They also gave some interesting general re recommendations. So there's a now a lot of interest in the UK using shared decision aids, uh, which we sit down with, with the patient to make a joint decision regarding surgery. If we are going to use mesh for incontinence surgery, then we need to explain about the type of mesh, whether it's absorbable, whether it's permanent, that it should be recorded on a national register. We need to record the um, name and manufacturer, the date of implantation, and also the name of, sur of the surgeon. So this all becomes much more traceable. So again, sensible um, advice from, uh, from NICE, really. So it might be sensible to pause at this point and think, what have we learned within the UK regarding mesh? I think we're all very aware that there's a small number of women who have serious complications and because of that have suffered serious morbidity. But I think we're also very aware that the mesh controversy within the UK is very much media driven and it makes no differentiation between a synthetic tape for incontinence and uh, synthetic mesh for urogenital prolapse. I think there's also a feeling amongst many of us that the rights of the many to benefit from these procedures are being denied by the few who have obviously had complications. 
I think there's a certain degree of trial by media. It's very prominent in, um, in, on the television and also in print media. And I think there may also a degree of um, maybe some of these mesh survivors are actually being exploited for other people's gain and perhaps even for litigation. And based in this fruori of um, chaos at the moment in the UK, are we really able to make a sound scientific judgment on how to move forward and whether these products should be reintroduced? So how do we make it safer? Well, of course, we need appropriate training with mentorship and working within a multidisciplinary team. We now have the results of prospective randomized controlled trials, such as Prospect. We audit our results. We have national surgical databases, such as a database from the British Society of Urogynecology. And also, there's now the IUGA database available uh, internationally. And the importance of reporting our complications to the regulatory authorities uh, was also stressed. So to conclude, where are we now with mid-urethral tapes within the UK? I think all of us think that they have proven efficacy in the management of stress urinary incontinence. There's good short-term and medium-term safety data, but fewer long-term studies. There's increasing evidence of late complications, but hopefully with registries and databases, we'll be able to identify these and uh, give our patients much better uh, information in the future. We're now trying to focus our complications into tertiary centers, which have the necessary expertise. The problem we have at the moment is we have this dichotomy between the NICE guidelines that say we can use a mid-urethral tape for incontinence and the Cumberledge report, which is, has um, still is effectively postponed MESH. So I guess to sum it up in one sentence, MESH in the UK is very much like Brexit. We've got absolutely no idea where we're going at the moment. Um, so with that comment, I'll um, leave you with a picture of our team from King's. Thank you very much. Thank you.